a greatly disliked one-term president who was impeached and did really shady things in the White House. Sound familiar? So there was greater division amongst the party and also young people didn't feel that they were represented in the party and they didn't feel like the establishment generally was serving them in any meaningful way. Does this sound familiar? So this entire situation was just this loaded powder keg that was just ready to explode. And of course, what was the spark that caused it? Excessive use of force by the police. Sound familiar? <laughs> There. My name is Leija. I'm a real life lawyer and I'm on a mission to demystify the law and how it affects your everyday life. Today I'm going to react to the trial of the Chicago 7. It's a new Netflix film starring in part Joseph Gordon-Levitt but also a number of other people whose names I'm not going to list out because it's a lot. Basically the story is about eight people and I know it's called the Chicago 7. Spoilers alert but we'll get to why. It's about eight men who were accused of inciting riots that occurred after the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. The whole movie centers around that trial and I want to watch it. Let's do it. Before I get started I want to offer the following disclaimer and that is that I'm a lawyer but I'm not your lawyer. Nothing that I say should be construed as legal advice and you should always seek the advice of a licensed attorney when you have any legal questions. Will someone tell me if I look like Dwayne The Rock Johnson? I can't unsee it. So I'm gonna give a little context to this film by going into the history a bit, mainly because I think that the history surrounding the film and the trial is so eerily reminiscent of the things we're going through right now. I think that makes sense why Aaron Sorkin made this film now. All right, so the year is 1968. The Vietnam War has been gaining momentum for the whole decade of the 60s and is reaching a fever pitch, though it will still continue to go on for another four or five years. If you're interested in learning more about the Vietnam War in this era, I highly recommend Ken Burns' movie on it. It's on Netflix, it's a series, it's super long, but it's really interesting. It's disturbing, but it's good. And like I said, post-World War II, this era probably most closely resembles what we're going through right now. It was a time when the country was going through a cultural revolution, a civil rights revolution. They were in the midst of a war that was killing tens of thousands of young people, both in from the United States and in Vietnam and surrounding countries. That coupled with the draft that was sending young men to fight for a country that they didn't feel really represented them, created the types of civil unrest that we're seeing emerge again right now. So in 1968, the Democratic National Convention was held in Chicago. It was a really contentious race. The Democratic Party was super divided in this time, and it was anticipated that Hubert Humphrey was going to be named the Democratic nominee. Lyndon B. Johnson had just stepped down, deciding not to run for a second term because he didn't perform well in the primaries, and so there, were, there was this split. You had Hubert Humphrey, who was going to follow in LBJ's footsteps in terms of the Vietnam War, and then you had George McGovern and Robert Kennedy who were also running earlier in 1968, and they were all running to be nominated by the Democratic Party to run against Richard Nixon, who was also a greatly disliked one-term president who was impeached and did really shady things in the White House. Sound familiar? Anyway, so amidst all this division within the Democratic Party, you have the assassination in 1968 of both Martin Luther King and then Robert Kennedy, who was running for the nomination. So there was greater division amongst the party and also young people didn't feel that they were represented in the party and they didn't feel like the establishment generally was serving them in any meaningful way. Does this sound familiar. So there was a lot of unrest, especially in young people, because they were being sent to die by a country that they didn't believe in. So the protesters were there because they were pushing an anti-war message. They knew that Humphrey was likely to be nominated and he wasn't anti-war. McGovern was seen as the anti-war candidate, but even that, a lot of the young protesters were saying, None of these people actually represent our interests and they're all easily bought out and corrupted. The Chicago mayor at the time was pretty authoritarian. He was very law and order and police friendly. And he knew that thousands of students were going to be coming to Chicago during the national convention. So he had all of the Chicago police department ready and working 12 hour shifts constantly. He also had the National Guard in and had put barbed wire around the convention center where the convention was going to be held. In total, there were about 10,000 protesters that showed up in Chicago and there were 23,000 armed forces, either police or National Guard on hand. So this entire situation was just this loaded powder keg that was just ready to explode. And of course, what was the spark that caused it? Excessive use of force by the police. Sound familiar? Reports that came out long after the riots actually took place finally concluded that it was the police that instigated the violence that occurred during the D Democratic National Convention. Police 
were indiscriminately beating protesters. Protesters were fighting back, but they were not armed. They did not have what the police had. They were being tear gassed like crazy to the point where all of Chicago was affected. Like people at the Democratic National Convention could feel the tear gas in the air. These riots led to the arrests of almost 700 protesters, as well as hundreds and hundreds of protesters being injured. Only about 190 of the police officers were injured. And this movie is about eight men who were charged with inciting those riots. What's weird to me is that the people who participated in this cultural revolution in the 60s that's depicted in this movie are the boomers who are now like walking around not wearing masks or who are like entrenched in politics and are like doing the same thing. I don't know what happened to all those revolutionary boomers because there were lots of them. Like did they all die? Did they all just do a lot of LSD and die? Is that what happened? Where are they? What are they doing? Hello? Maybe they're all dead. Head. Anyway, before we get into watching the clips, I do want to give a trigger warning that this film is filled with assault and violence and extremely violent racism. So, um, yeah, if you're gonna watch it, just uh, be prepared. I'm John Mitchell. Thomas Friend, Mr. Attorney General, and this is Richard Schultz. Richard, Chicago was more fucked up than any 10 things I've ever seen in my life. Sir, the convention, the riots. Yes, sir. Sid, Johnny Walker okay with everybody? Yes, thank you. As a matter of fact, we don't believe any federal laws were broken last summer. Mr. Fran had our office run a thorough investigation. There was some trespassing, the destruction of public property, lewd behavior, I suppose, something that would rise to the level. You think you and your boss are in the Attorney General's office because I want you to seek an indictment for violating a federal trespassing law? Our office wasn't aware that the Justice Department wanted to seek any indictments at all, sir. We do. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, uh, he looks good as an attorney. Okay, so Joseph Gordon-Levitt in this movie is playing a federal prosecutor. What do federal prosecutors do? They enforce federal laws. They work in U.S. attorneys' offices across the country, and under the attorney general's directions, they enforce federal laws, they prosecute people who break federal laws. So the attorney general, also called the AG, is the head of the U.S. Department of Justice. So Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character is meeting with the head of the Department of Justice, who's giving him, a young prosecutor out of Chicago, a direct assignment to prosecute these men. So the attorney general under Nixon was John Mitchell, this guy. He was a New Yorker from Queens, he fought in World War II, and and then he was a municipal bonds lawyer in New York for like 30 years. I'm not really gonna go into what a municipal bond is because I don't know. He met Nixon in New York in the 60s and Nixon joined his law firm so they were all municipal bonds lawyers and they became friends. Then when Nixon decided to run for president he asked John Mitchell to run his campaign. I'm not really sure why John Mitchell was qualified to do that but he did it and Nixon was pretty well known for his cronyism so I guess that makes sense. So Nixon gets elected president and he appoints John Mitchell as the attorney general. Interestingly Nixon made a direct appeal to the director of the FBI asking that John Mitchell not be subjected to a thorough background check as is typical of a new attorney general. That's really wild because I worked for the Department of Justice as an intern for three months and it took six months prior to that of getting a background check done before I was allowed to start that internship and I was just a low-level law clerk. So the fact that he was asking that no background check be done for the leader of the whole thing is pretty shady. So John Mitchell was super into this whole law and order idea. He was really into like wiretapping, police use of force. He was all about it. He loved law and order. He was also a convicted felon. In 1975 he would be found guilty of conspiracy, perjury, and obstruction of justice for his role in the Watergate scandal, for which he would serve 19 months in prison. This hasn't happened yet at this point in the film though. Now he's just the brand new shiny attorney general at the beginning of the Nixon administration who's ready to inspire still the law. Mm. Section 2101 of Title 18. That's the federal law that was broken. That's the Rat Brown law. In conspiracy to cross state lines in order to incite violence. Comes with a maximum of 10 years. You want all 10. So that law does not come with a maximum of 10 years. It comes with a maximum of five years and $5,000 fine. Okay, so Title 18, Section 2101, the Rat Brown Law. What is that? Okay, so this is a real law. It was passed in 1968 as part of the 1968 Civil Rights Law, and it says, whoever travels in interstate or foreign commerce or uses any facility of interstate or foreign commerce, including but not limited to the mail, telegraph, telephone, radio, or television, with intent to incite a riot, or to organize, promote, encourage, participate in, or carry on a riot, or to commit any act of violence in furtherance of a riot, or to aid or abet any person in inciting or participating in carrying on a riot, or committing any act of violence in furtherance of a riot, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than five years or both. Again, at the end, fine of 5,000 and or five years prison. All right, so what does this mean? Basically, the feds can get involved when crimes 
cross state lines or are involved in interstate commerce. So using a telephone or in modern day an email or any sort of internet service would qualify as crossing state lines. So basically what this law is saying is if you cross state lines or communicate across state lines with the intent to create, incite, or promote a riot, then you could be found liable under this law and convicted criminally at the federal level. So there are a few contentious things about the law. First of all, the intent portion of it. Proving that someone had intent to start a riot when they crossed state lines versus an intent to exercise their First Amendment right to demonstrate peaceably, hard to prove. Also, the First Amendment protects the right to free speech. However, that protection does not extend to speech that is meant to imminently cause violence. Here, however, the statute is prohibiting not only speech that is meant to imminently cause violence, but also speech that's meant to generally promote a riot or to encourage a riot, which is arguably protected under the First Amendment. So constitutionally, this entire law has been questioned and certain courts have thrown it out as unconstitutional because it's prohibiting speech that's allowed and protected under the First Amendment. And this law has become relevant recently. It was cited after the Charlottesville riots as a means of prosecuting the far-right protesters who showed up and incited violence. And the Attorney General, currently Bill Barr, cited this law in response to the riots that occurred here in Minneapolis this past summer. Bill Barr suggesting that people who showed up for the riots were potentially breaking federal laws. It is accurate that the law is known as the Rap Brown Act. It's named after a person named H. Rap Brown, who was a activist. He was part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and served for a while as their liaison between the Black Panther Party. He advocated for black power and urban uprisings and was accused of inciting riots throughout the 1960s. He was wanted by the FBI and there are intern FBI memos talking about neutralizing him is part of a well-documented push by the FBI in this era to neutralize or silence far-left radical supporters who were seen as just degenerates, who didn't work and who didn't sign up for the draft and who didn't contribute to society in any way. Eventually, H. Rap Brown converted to Islam and changed his name to Jamil Abdullah Al-Amin. He's currently serving a life sentence in prison for a number of crimes, one of which being killing a cop. There is evidence and arguments that are made in favor of his innocence and he maintains his innocence as well as his family. I really can't do justice to this guy's story. That's just such a small piece of it. I highly recommend looking at his Wikipedia page to learn more or read the books that he wrote. Also, it is true that I'm pretty sure lawyers did drink in the middle of the day back then and now they just do it a lot in the night. <clears throat> Mr. Attorney General, the Rat Brown Law was created by Southern whites in Congress to limit the free speech of black activists, civil rights activists. I know who were why it was passed. Why the f is he teaching? It doesn't matter why it was passed. It matters what it can do. We're not sure what it can do because no one's ever been charged with it before. Well, that makes it exciting. So that is true. It was a brand new law passed in 1968, so no one had tested it yet or been prosecuted under it. And the background that he gave on the law, though a little dramatized, is accurate. The law was passed in response to a lot of riots that were happening in the 1960s and in response to the countercultural movement that saw a lot of these hippies and rioters and extreme leftists as these antisocial degenerates who weren't contributing to society. The law was an anti-riot act that was meant to stop the riot at its source, at its conception. And it was largely seen as a backlash against LBJ's push for increasing funding for public programs like housing and employment. It was pushed by pro-order and pro-segregationist white Southern congressmen as a means of quelling the unrest in the 60s. The congressmen wanted to repress what they saw as dangerous acts by these mostly minority-led activist groups. It's also true that conspiracy would be hard to prove here if none of these men had ever met each other before. Conspiracy is a crime that can be added on to a lot of other crimes, so you can be found to have both committed a crime and committed conspiracy to commit that crime. It's basically an add-on to make sure that maybe if you're found that you didn't commit the actual crime, the defendant could still be found to have committed the crime of conspiring to commit a crime. However, it is hard to conspire when you've never spoken to the other defendant before. Over here. Over here. You don't know what to do with the egg now, do you? No. Sasha Baron Cohen in a serious-ish role kind of throwing me for a loop here. Mr. Bill. Kunstler, Mr. Kunstler, Bill. just one question. Bill. Mr. Kunstler. Oh, I don't know. Hang on, hang on. Quiet down. I want you all to meet uh, a new addition to the defense team. This is Leonard Wineglass. Okay, but the casting of these defense attorneys is excellent. Not only does that actually look like what Kunstler looked like, but also defense attorneys generally. Being a defense attorney can be a perfectly respectable job, but man, a lot of them look pretty disheveled. Interestingly, this attorney, Kunstler, also served as attorney for H. Rat Brown in his defense. Are the people ready to make opening arguments? We are, Your Honor. I don't have my lawyer here. 
It's not your turn to speak. My trial's begun without my lawyer. Please sit. Now, the defendants would tell you that they represent three different groups. They would tell you that one group Excuse is... me. Yes, sir. I'd like to clarify something for the jurors. There are two Hoffmans in this courtroom, the defendant Abby Hoffman and myself, Judge Julius Hoffman. Thank you, sir. I didn't want there to be confusion on the matter. Man, I don't think there's much chance they're going to mix us up. <laughs> the record should reflect that defendant Hoffman and I are not related. Father, no. Mr. Hoffman, are you familiar with contempt of court? It's practically a religion for me, sir. Wow, all right. Well, that scene was wild. I don't think I've ever seen a judge interrupt opening arguments. I mean, I guess they could. Judges get to kind of run their court as they see fit, but I've never seen that. Basically what's happening here, opening arguments are at the very beginning of a trial. Each side gets to go in front of the jury and present their case. They're gonna say, here's the story, here's what we're going to show you, here's how you're going to find for my side. Each side gets to stand up and do that. And it's hugely important because it's the way that each side is able to tell the jury exactly what their case is. You remember jury are lay people. They're not lawyers usually. They don't have any background in the law. They need to be told a story so that they can be led to the outcome that each side wants. So getting interrupted in the middle of opening arguments would be, I imagine, really stressful. Again, the defendants would tell you that these are three distinct groups, but they all- Excuse me. Yes. May I speak? No, sir. I have a right to counsel and his honor knows that. Don't tell the court what it does and does not know. Be seated. My lawyer, Charles Gary, is in a hospital in Oakland having undergone gallbladder surgery. Mr. Consular, you are sitting right next to the man. Just represent him. It's the same case. The fact that there's a lawyer near Mr. Seal does not satisfy the requirements of due process. I have a, a right. A motion was made for postponement due to Mr. Gary's medical condition. I was there. Your Honor denied that motion. Therefore, Mr. Seal is here without legal representation. I'm trying to be clear that I can't muddy Mr. Seal's grounds for appeal by appearing to speak as his lawyer. I don't ask you to compromise Mr. Seal's position, sir, but I will not permit him to address the jury when his perfectly competent lawyer is sitting... For the fourth time, he's not Bobby's lawyer. Charge Mr. Seal with one count of contempt of court. So what's happening with Bobby Seale is that his lawyer is sick, so he's not present. And the defense made a motion to ask for the trial to be postponed, meaning that his attorney asked the court to postpone the trial because he was not able to be present. Criminal defendants constitutionally are guaranteed the right to competent representation by a lawyer. Defendants can elect to defend themselves. That's what's known as being pro se. Being a pro se litigant means you're defending yourself or representing yourself before the court. However, that's something that the defendant has to elect to do and judges are very careful to make sure that the defendant fully understands what they're doing if they do elect to be pro se. Here, it's very obvious that Bobby Steele does not elect to be pro se and therefore this judge is violating the constitution by continuing with this trial. So this is also why the other attorney, counselor, is being really adamant that he is not Bobby Seale's lawyer. And it's true that Bobby Seale just being near a lawyer does not protect his constitutional rights. He needs to actually be represented by a lawyer at trial if that's what he wants because that's his constitutional right. Attorney Kunstler is trying to make it extremely abundantly clear that he is not acting as Bobby Seale's lawyer because Bobby Seale doesn't want him to be his lawyer so it goes against ethics because ethically it's really important to create a very distinct line when there is or is not an attorney client relationship and Bobby Seale doesn't consent to him being his attorney so it just wouldn't work. Plus importantly he is making it abundantly clear on the record. You'll notice the court reporter typing furiously, they are taking down every single word that's being said because it's important to have everything on the record. Here, Attorney Kunstler is making it abundantly clear that he is not Bobby Seale's attorney so that when Bobby Seale, if he were to be convicted in this trial, he can then appeal it up to the Court of Appeals and say, my constitutional rights were violated, this trial needs to be thrown out. So it's really important that for the record, if a violation is occurring at this trial, that they maintain it in the records so that on appeal, they can get the entire thing thrown out. So again, I've never seen a judge act like this. However, apparently this is re true that Judge Julius Hoffman had an awful repu reputation for being just generally inept as a judge. And he had a habit of like interrupting counsel or like 
during trial, if counsel stands up to make an objection, he would just say overruled before they even say anything. Like he was known for being uh, pretty unpredictable and, and generally unfavorable to defendants. And also this guy was born in 1895 and became a lawyer in 1915. Like he's old as dirt even here. I mean, he's dead now, but ancient. Can you imagine? Like 1950, he was 20 in 1915. He just like walked into law school and they were like, here's your degree, go be a lawyer. I feel like you could just do anything in 1915 if you just showed up and declared yourself something. So this is probably a dramatization, but it is true that throughout this trial, he was super argumentative and hostile towards the defense. It's also true that one of the defense's tactics was being disruptive and kind of making a mockery of the whole thing because they saw it as this political trial that they were being put on the stand to prove a point, not because they actually committed any crimes. So it's true that people like Rubin and Hoffman, the defendant Hoffman, Sasha Baron Cohen's character would, yeah, talk back. There was an actual instance where Judge Hoffman did say, please for the record note that defendant Hoffman and I are not related. And then defendant Hoffman yelled out like, father, why have you forsaken me in the middle of court? Which is funny. Okay, so being held in contempt of court just means that you're generally being disobedient to the court, you're showing disrespect to the court, you're not following orders of the court. This can happen during trial but also in preparation for trial if you're not responding to motions or orders or complying with orders, you can be held in contempt. And that gives the judge discretion to then fine you or sentence you to jail time. And it's true that this judge during this case sentenced all of the defendants, including both of the defense attorneys, to prison time for contempt of court. All of it was eventually overturned on appeal, but this, this is not inaccurate. I, Bobby G. Seale, have a motion pro se to defend myself. I'd like to invoke the precedent of Adams versus U.S. ex rel McCann, where the Supreme Court- All right, is that's enough. Where are you learning these things? Your Honor, the other defendants would like to join in Mr. Seal's motion. Are you now speaking on behalf of Mr. Seal? No, Your Honor, I'm speaking on behalf of the other defendants. You're standing right next to him. Why don't you just represent him? Because I'm not his lawyer, sir. If I understand Mr. Seal this last month and a half, and I believe I have, he is not represented by counsel. Overruled. I am being denied Mr. right now Seale, my constitutional will you be quiet? right for will legal you, representation. Will you be quiet? You have lawyers to speak for you. No, he doesn't. Okay, so under like regular circumstances, it would be absolutely just unfathomable to be a lawyer in a court and to scream at a judge it's just like it's like on i can't it's unthinkable in this situation though you're supposed to feel this like righteous anger though and you want him to yell at this judge because this judge is representing the entire establishment so that felt good he is now petitioning the court to proceed pro se meaning that he wants to represent himself and the court has denied that the case that he cites, Adams v. United States X. Rel. McCann, is a real case from 1942, and it said that a defendant can, if competent, waive his or her right to a jury and to representation by counsel, which is what I said earlier. So that's what he did here, and at this point, the judge could have allowed him to proceed pro se, but instead he just didn't and continues to assert that counselor is his attorney, and so, like, all of this could be challenged on appeal, basically. And it is true that during this trial, Bobby Seal did not have an attorney and the judge denied him the right to represent himself pro se. Let the record show that I tried fairly and impartially I tried to get the defendant to sit on his own. I ask you again, Mr. Seal, and you may indicate by raising your head up and down or moving it from side to side. If I have your assurance that you will not do anything to disrupt this trial, if I allow you to resume proper order, do I have your assurance? Mr. Schultz, call your next witness. Right, um, horrifying and accurate. Bobby Seal was gagged, bound, and chained to a chair during this trial. What's inaccurate about this is that it lasted for days. He was gagged and bound to his chair for days. And through his gag, he would 
continue to try to speak up on his own behalf. There were no cameras allowed in the courtroom, but a court sketch artist captured the image of him being bound and gagged and tied to his chair, which sparked a ton of outrage across the country when it was published. And it's actually led to a lot of songs being written about it. It was a cultural moment for sure. This is what happened. It's true. And in doing this, the judge cited this precedent called Illinois v. Allen. But this case held that a defendant could lose his or her constitutional right to be present at trial if they were so disruptive that it prohibited the trial from continuing. It didn't hold that in a court of law you could bind and gag a defendant. Your Honor, may we approach? Your Honor, our defendant is gagged and bound in an American courtroom. He brought it on himself. Are you insane, Mr. Kunzler? Love of God. What do you want, Mr. Schultz? This is your sidebar. Your Honor, at this time, the government would like to make a motion that Bobby Seale be separated from wait, the rest wait, of the Yes, wait, sir, wait. please. A motion that Bobby Seale be separated from the rest of the defendants and this case be declared a mistrial. This is also a very realistic depiction of a sidebar, probably more realistic than a lot of other things I've ever seen on TV and in movies. Basically, if you want to speak privately with the judge, you ask if you can approach the bench or you call for a sidebar. And before approaching the bench, you have to ask to approach the bench. At sidebar, both the prosecution and the defense should be present because they all need to be present to hear. Some courts have noise machines that they turn on during a sidebar so that the jury and none of the parties can hear what's being talked about. And they just discuss procedural things or other things going on in the case. So that's accurate. And it's also accurate that Bobby Seale's case was eventually severed from the other seven cases because he was in no way tied to the execution or planning of any of these riots or with any of these groups. He was, however, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party and the head of the Black Panther Party in Chicago. And it's not inconceivable and kind of clear that his inclusion in this trial was just a means of convicting him for something in order to neutralize him. After being severed from this case, he was never actually tried for any of these charges. So as horrific as this was, this experience that he had that kind of shook the nation, this is such a tiny piece of Bobby Seale's story, and I encourage you to go read his Wikipedia article as well, or some of the books he's written. Okay, so this trial went from September 24th, 1969 to February 18th of 1970, so about five months. Calling this trial day 151 is a little misleading. This is the sentencing hearing. Basically what happens is you're at trial, you conclude the trial, the jury deliberates, the jury hands down a verdict, and then after the verdict is handed down, there is a sentencing hearing that is scheduled and everyone shows up at the sentencing hearing and then the judge sentences the defendants to a certain amount of time in prison. A lot of times the sentencing hearing doesn't happen until two months after the trial ends. In this situation, actually, the sentencing hearing happened two days after the end of the trial. It was kind of expedited. But sentencing hearing doesn't count as a trial day, so it's a little misleading to say this is day 151 of the trial because the trial already concluded. The law requires that before sentencing, I allow the defendant or defendants to make a statement to the court. I've advised defense counsel that the court will allow one defendant to speak for the group, and I've been advised the group has chosen Mr. Hayden. Is that right? Yes, sir. I'd like you to make your statement brief and without political content of any kind. If you make your statement brief, if you make it respectful, if you make it remorseful and to the point, I will look favorably upon that when administering my sentence. Your Honor, since this trial began, 4,752 U.S. troops have been killed in Vietnam. And the following are their names. Private First Class Dennis Walter Kipp, 18 years old. Private Eric Allen Bosch, 21 years old. Mr. Kunstler! Lance Corporal Robert Earl Ellis, 
19 years old. Mr. Councillor, Lance Corporal he Anthony will Michael not Steen, read 5,000 names for the record. Robert Ford, 21 years old. There will be order. Staff Sergeant David Cruz Chavez. Such an Aaron Sorkin scene. So inspirational. All right, it is true at sentencing that defendants have the right to speak on their own behalf. However, that right is held by each defendant individually. So each one has a right to speak on their own behalf, not to be spoken for by all of them by one defendant. Also, it is true that judges do have a bit of discretion in their sentencing of defendants. It's bound by certain things like the statute itself. So for example, this statute said that they could have a maximum of five years imprisonment. So the judge can't give them more than that five years. They're also somewhat bound by sentencing guidelines, which are guidelines that are printed every year by the United States Sentencing Commission that basically give a range of months for every federal crime for judges to determine the best sentence to give defendants. They're not bound by the sentencing guidelines, but judges tend to follow it. And the guidelines are arranged because they can vary depending on the severity of the crime, if the defendant was cooperative, it can be lowered, things like that. So the judge has discretion in how much time they actually give to defendants. And they can take into consideration the defendant's behavior at the sentencing hearing in determining whether or not they think that the defendant deserves more or less time. So it's true that he could take into consideration what Hayden was about to say. However, he couldn't then use what Hayden said against the other defendants. It's like not constitutional. Also, I will say I read the sentencing transcript of the actual sentencing hearing that happened and this didn't happen, unfortunately. He did not read all the names of all the fallen soldiers in Vietnam since the start of the trial. What happened in reality is that each defendant was given time to make a brief statement. They all said a brief statement. They were each sentenced the full extent of the law, five years in prison plus $5,000 in fines. And then additionally, they were sentenced to time for contempt of court. Yeah, but none of that really makes for great cinema. So I get why Aaron Sorkin wrote this in to the script. And like I said, they ended up appealing the case up to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which obviously fully overturned all the convictions and sent it back down to the trial court to be retried because this trial was clearly so bad. And it turned out that the U.S. attorney at that point decided not to try them again for these charges and so they were dropped. Man, what a horrible but like really fascinating case. I had not actually ever heard of this. Like I'd heard of the Chicago riots in the 1968 convention but like I didn't know about this entire trial or anything which now I feel bad about. So I'm glad I learned. I learned so much from, from doing this, you guys. And the parallels between this case and what's been happening over the past like eight months in this country are like kind of shocking. And it's important to note that Trump has appointed a number of judges, like a massive number of judges that will hold their seats as judges for decades to come. And this movie is a really good depiction of how much power judges have to affect our judicial system and whether or not justice is actually handed down to people. All right. Overall, I give this movie an A for being topical, very topical, well-timed, Aaron Sorkin. I give it like a C minus because it uses Bobby Seale and violence against black people as kind of just a prop for white guilt. And I give it a B for accuracy. It's mostly accurate. He took some creative liberties, but honestly, a lot of the court scenes were pretty accurate. And overall, I was uh, thoroughly entertained. Thank you so much for watching. If there's something you want me to watch and react to, please comment down below. If you found this video informational or entertaining, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you want to hear more from me. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Goodbye.